Today we're going to talk about binary arithmetic. Now, the way we look at binary arithmetic is it's fairly straightforward to do base 2 or base 10 arithmetic, add, subtract, multiply, divide. And a lot of you are going to be tempted to take what we give you in base 2 and convert it in base 10, just add, subtract, multiply, divide as you normally would. However, what I'd like you to do is do this in base 2. The reason we're going to do this is because it will highlight how you actually have to do this, how you have to build the circuits when we get into digital logic, or how you build it in C++ using Boolean algebra, that sort of stuff. So what I'd like you to do is whenever we're doing this binary arithmetic is take a look at it in terms of base 2. Start putting out of your mind the base 10 portion of it. Say, well, I can just convert 1100 into 12 and then add it or subtract it or multiply divide. Because once again, I'm trying to train you to actually look at how this is performed inside the computer, why it's performed like this inside the computer, and then how to go about actually designing this inside the computer, because that's going to be your job to in future labs, especially when we get to digital logic, is to build this so that we can do these, perform this addition, subtraction, multipl multiplication, and division just using signals, just using electrons flowing or not flowing through a transistor. So take a look at your screen. What we're going to do is be able to add two binary numbers together without converting bases. So once again, that's what I'm talking about is don't convert to base 10 first and then add or subtract, multiply, divide. Try to do this in base two because that'll make it a lot easier whenever you get to digital logic. Be able to subtract two binary numbers without converting numbers, multiply, and we're going to use division, two different algorithms for division. Understand what constitutes an overflow and how to detect one. Understand what happens when a value is widened or narrowed. So wide means go from something like an 8-bit value to a 32-bit value. Narrowed means we go from like a 32-bit value down to an 8-bit value. And differentiate between zero extension and sign extension. So we'll take a look at what that means. So first, what we're going to do is addition because that's the easiest one to do. In addition, base 2, recall, is using digits 0 and 1. So each place can have a maximum value of 1. And so what that means is if we add 1 plus 1, that actually gives us the value 2. And if you remember about binary, 2 is 1, 0. So 1 plus 1 is actually the value 0, carry the 1. So if we look at, let me show you what that's going to look like in base 10. So I'll bring up the whiteboard here. So in base 10, if we did something like 1, 9 plus 2, so what we're doing is we're looking at each digit place first. So 9 plus 2 is 11, right? However, in, we're looking at what goes into the 1's digit. So what goes into the 1's digit is the 1. And then what we have to do is we have to carry the 1 over into, the, in this case, the 10's digit. So 1 plus 1 gives us 2, which is 21. So that's essentially what we're going to do in binary. So let's take a look at this in binary, which is 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1, and we'll add 2 to it. Okay, so this is actually the value 19, this is the value 2. We know that because this is the 16's place, this is the 2's place, this is the 1. 16, 17, 18, 19, so there we go. So what we're going to do is look at the 1's place first, then move on to the 2's place, the 4's place, the 8's place, and then the 16's place. So let's take a look at what this is going to do. 1 plus 0 is just like adding 1 plus 0 in base 10. That's going to be the value 1. There is no carry out, so we're good to go there. Now we reach 1 plus 1. So 1 plus 1 is actually the value 2, right? So what goes into this place? Well, it's going to be a 0, carry the 1. And so now we have 1 plus 0, which is 1, no carry. We have 0, and we have a 1 here. So now let's take a look what that's going to give us. So that's 16, that's the 8's place, that's the 4's place, and that's the 1's place. So that gives us 21. So notice we get the same result, we just have to be very careful. Now. In base 2, there are several different things we can get. So we took a look at what this looks like both in base 10 and in base 2. You can see what we do is we actually are looking for to place it in the 1's place, the 2's place, the 4's place, the 8's place. Just like in base 10, whenever we do this, we look to see what digit are we going to drop down in the 1's place, the 10's place, the 100's place, and the 1000's place. So that's why I say don't don't rush through this. Take your time in figuring out exactly what's going on, especially when you're practicing and you have, you're not under the time crunch of, say, an exam or something like that. Take a look at what is actually happening, and you can see the parallels between base 10 and base 2. It's just, many people think it's just a completely new system, and it's not. And so take your time and think, okay, what do I need to drop down in the ones place? Okay, when I'm done with that, what do I need to carry off into the next place, the twos place? And what do I need to carry off into the, the fours place and the eights place and so on and so forth? 
So there are several different ways we can actually get base two to carry out. So let's take a look at, so remember in each case we have a carry in. So if I did something like one, one plus one, so that's the value three plus one, which should give us four. So one plus one is actually zero carry the one. So as you can see, we have three inputs. We actually have the carry, it's called CN, not to be confused with C++ is CN. We have the top, also the left, the operand, and then we have the right or the bottom operand. Okay. So in this case, we have three inputs. So we have to consider three different inputs. So let's take a look at top, bottom, carry in, and let's see what the sum is going to be versus the carry out. So remember, we actually have two outputs. The sum is what is actually going to go into that digits place. The carry out is what we're going to carry into the next digits place. So let's say the top is a zero, the bottom is zero, carry is zero. Well, obviously zero plus zero is zero, carry out zero, right? So zero plus zero has not changed, it's still zero. What about zero plus zero with a carry in of one? Well, obviously that's going to be one because it's zero plus one without a carry. Zero one zero is also one and zero. Uh, 0, 1, 1, as you can see here. So if the bottom number is a 1, the top number is a, one, a 0, and the carry in is a 1, that's 1 plus 1, which is actually the value 2. So our sum is going to be 0, and we're going to carry out a 1. Then what we do is we get into where the top numbers are 1. Okay, so really the weird one is this last one here, which is one plus one plus one, which is actually the value three, which if you think of three, it's this right here. So what are we gonna drop down in a ones place? A one, what are we gonna carry out? A one. So that's how we get this. Now, if we take a look at this, if you remember back to your, your um, logical operators, we can actually see what's going on here. So your sum is actually zero, one, one, zero. If you remember, that is an XOR. We have 0, 0, 0, 0001 for the carry, that's an AND gate. We have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0011, which is an OR gate. And we have 1001, 0, 0, 0, 1, which is actually what's called an XNOR. So it's just the opposite of a NOR. So as you can see, we're starting to build this so that we understand what this looks like inside of a computer, because that's the whole purpose of doing this. We wouldn't be in base two because we have 10 fingers and st unless we had to go to a computer where we only had two signals off and on. So that's what this is looking like here. So as you can see, the really the only thing that we have to consider is the sum and this carry out. And really all we get is one zero or one carry the one. So there's actually really only three different things that we have to consider. So there's one plus zero plus one. There's, well, let's just do it this way. 1 plus 1 plus 0, so there's no carry, that's 0, carry the 1. Then we have 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 1, carry the 1. Everything else, you just drop down whatever values it's going to be. So that's the simple way to actually look at what this is going to be. So it is possible to get 1, carry the 1. So let's take a look at the value 7, and let's add to it the value 3. Okay, now I don't have to put these two zeros in there, but it just makes it nice and consistent. So remember one plus one is zero. So that's, we're up here right now. Zero, carry the one. So now we have that situation where we have one plus one plus one, which is one, carry the one. And now we're back into the situation where we have one plus one plus zero. So one plus one plus zero. So if you remember, this carry is actually zero. So that's one plus one plus zero. So in this, it's going to be zero, carry the one. And then we have zero plus zero plus one, which is straightforward, we add the one. So if you look at this, this is the value eight, this is the value two, so that gives us the value 10. Remember, this is seven plus three, which gives us the value 10. So that works out just like we wanted it to. So in addition, that's really all we need to consider. One plus one is the value zero, carry the one. One plus one plus one is the value one, carry out a one. And so those are really the only things that you have to consider that are slightly strange from just adding ones and zeros together. So let's go back to our lecture here and let's see what, what's going to happen. So addition hopefully is fairly straightforward. I give you an example right here. Uh, you can always check yourself by going to base 10. Remember, I want you to be able to do this in base two because that's what we're going to do in digital logic and so on and so forth. But always check yourself, always check your answer, especially when you're practicing this because it, otherwise it, 
you're going to learn two different things here. Number one, how to convert binary into decimal and vice versa, and actually how to add them and subtract them or multiply, divide, whatever the operation happens to be. And then what you're going to see is you're going to see the parallels between base 10 and base 2, and that there's not much of a difference there. So one of the things that can possibly happen, because we don't have an infinite precision inside of a computer, is we can get what's called overflow. So in most places, or in most arithmetic, we actually can have an extended digit. So for example, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. So notice we've actually added a digit. So we only had ones places right here, and now we have a twos place and a ones place. However, if you think about back to a computer, a char is only eight bits, so we only have eight digits. So what if I had one, 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 plus one? Well, because this is eight digits, what we're going to do is we're going to get eight zeros and a one. So there's actually nine digits, but we can only store eight digits inside of a char. So what happens is this is actually what's stored in a char. So in this case, 255 plus one is actually the value zero. So that's what's going to happen because we don't have an infinite digit that we can use. Now, some languages such as Python try to mimic an infinite precision, but it's not possible inside of a computer. Now we can mimic it and make it look like it's doing that, but actually when we add, subtract, multiply, divide, inside a computer, we have a finite precision. So this is what's called a overflow. So what we've done is we actually overflowed because we have eight bits available and we need nine bits. So this is what's called an overflow. And in this case, an overflow means that uh, we can't really guarantee what the value uh, of the output is. Now, sometimes if, if you look at two's complement and stuff like that, we actually want an overflow. That's the only way it works. But in the overflow in this consideration, we have to say, well, 255 plus one should be 256. But in this case, it's the value zero. So if we detect an overflow, we cannot rely on whatever the output is going to be. So one of the things that we can do is add negative numbers. So if you remember back to the twos complement, so let's take an, an example of a twos complement number and let's add them together. The convenient thing about twos complement is we can just add the two numbers together. Using that overflow capability, you'll see that we get the correct answer. So let's do minus three plus 10. Obviously that should be the value seven, so, let, so let's see what happens. To figure out what minus three is, we would take three and take the twos complement. So three is zero, 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 zero zero one one if we flip all the bits and add one we get something that looks like this so now we do one 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 zero one plus ten which is zero 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 we need eight plus two and let's add those two things together so one plus zero is the value one zero plus one is the value one one plus zero is the value one and one plus one is zero carry the one one plus one is zero carry the one zero, carry the one, zero, carry the one, and zero, I'm sorry, zero carry the one, that's zero, and a one right there. Notice that that one is our ninth bit. So this is what we mean by this is how two's complement works. Because what's gonna happen is remember, these are both eight bit values, so we're gonna truncate at this eight bit, that because this is our overflow digit, and because it overflows, let's take a look at what happens now. So now we have a four plus two plus one, which is, seven. So because of the way two's complement works, we can actually use two's complement just to add two numbers directly together and we get the right result. Obviously, if we had an infinite precision, this wouldn't work. And so the two's complement number system actually makes it so that negative three plus 10 is the value seven. So negative numbers, uh, we can actually use subtraction as adding the negative number. So let's say we had 10 minus two. Well, this is actually 10 plus minus two. Well, how do we get minus two from two? Well, remember we flip all the bits, which is the ones complement, and then add one, which gives us the twos complement. And so for subtraction, a lot of times it's easier just to take the twos complement of a pot of whatever the, the right hand operand is in a subtraction and just add them together. And obviously as I've shown you right up here in this example, we actually get the positive value. So let's take a look at another example where we get a negative value. So let's say minus 10 plus three. So minus 10, once again, 10 is one, zero, one, zero. Let's use eight bits here. Okay, and we flip all the bits, add one. Okay, and when we add one, we get one, 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 zero, one, one, zero. Okay, so that's the value 
minus 10, and 3, if you remember, is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Let's add these two numbers together, and we should get minus 7. So 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 0. Carry the 1. 1 plus 1 is 0. Carry the 1. 1 drops down, and then we get 1's out here. Notice that nothing actually overflowed here. So, but we look at the most significant bit, which is right here, and we know that it's negative. So to actually figure out what the value is, we flip all the bits, add one. We know it's going to be a negative number, but now to get the magnitude, we flip all the bits, add one. So that's zero, 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 one, one, and zero plus one gives us zero, one, one, one. Okay. Now, if we take a look at that, that's four plus two plus one which is the value negative seven. So it works either way. So that's the best way to look at this is the two's complement, we just add it directly. There's nothing we have to do differently. Now for subtraction, a lot of times we can just add the negative value of the right-hand operand for subtraction. And so that's an easy way to actually perform this mathematics. So looking at our lectures, now what we have to look at is multiplication. So multiplication, if you remember, using longhand, Let's do it in base 10 real quick. So let's say we had, so let's do 10 times seven. So now the easiest thing is, is notice we have a zero here. We can actually drop the zero down and the seven times one gives us this. But let's do it the, the slow way first, just so we know what's going on. And what we would do is zero times seven gives us zero. Okay, now we're about to move into the tens place, so what we have to do is add a placeholder zero, and then we do seven times one, add those two together, and we get the value 70. So that's exactly what we're going to do in multiplication first. And then I'm gonna show you an algorithm in which we can do it in C++ or in digital logic. So let's take a look at a, so the easiest thing about this is base two, you're multiplying by ones and zeros, that's it. So let's take a look at how we would multiply two numbers together. So let's do seven, zero, one, 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 and let's do three, zero, zero, one, one. So if you think of that, seven times three should give us the value 21. So let's go ahead and multiply these. So the very first thing we're gonna do is start in the ones place, which is right here. So one times one gives us one. One times one gives us one, one times one gives us one, one times zero gives us zero. Okay, now we're about to move the to twos place. We have to add the placeholder zero here. And now we're gonna do one times one, which is one, one times one, which is one, one times one, which is one, and one times zero, which is zero. Notice that this is the exact same number that this is, except shifted over one place to the left. And so this is shifted left one gives us this result here. Now keep that in mind because that's exactly what we're going to do to actually multiply these two numbers together. And now notice the left two are zeros, so we're done there. So one plus zero is one, one plus one is zero, carry the one, one plus one plus one is one, carry the one, one plus one is zero, carry the one, and then we have a one drop down. So that is the value 16 plus four plus one. 16 plus four is the value 20 plus one gives us 21. And that's what we thought it was going to be. So in multiplication, nothing's changed. In fact, it's a lot easier because we're multiplying by ones and zeros. So let's discuss how to multiply two numbers together using base two, but using shifting operations instead. So what we've looked at, so let me go ahead and bring up the whiteboard here. What we looked at is what actually happens whenever we multiply two numbers together. So let's say we had 0010 0, and then multiply that by 0011. Well, every time we see a one here, what we do is we copy this down. So we copy 0010. Well, what's going to happen whenever we move to the twos place? Where we're going to shift this left by one place, which is going to get 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay? And then what happens to this number in the bottom? Well, we only care about this bit right here. So we shift it right by one place. So now what we're going to do is multiply 1. So we see a 1 there, so we copy the entire number down again, which is 0010. 0, 0. Now we do that until this number becomes zero. Remember, as we shift right, this number is going to eventually be padded with zeros on the left-hand side, and it'll go to zero. So hopefully you can start seeing what this is going to look like in C++. Number one, we'll call this top and this bottom, okay? And so what we're going to do is we have to make sure that the bottom is... So what we're going to do is look at how we multiply two numbers together 
and inside of C++ using shifting operations because we want to be able to narrow this down into digital logic using just those and not exclusive or inclusive or those type of gates to be able to perform these operations. So let's take a look at 0010 multiplied by 0011. Okay, so notice what we're going to do is if we find a one here, we copy this top number down, which will be 0010. It's the same thing as looking at one times 00, one times one is one, one times 00, and so on and so forth. When we move to the next, we're going to add a zero here, and if we find a one, we copy the number down again, 01. Zero, zero. So how do we distinguish this number from this number? Well, if you are observant, you can see that this number on the bottom is actually the top number shifted left by one place. Okay, well, if I add a one here, we're going to have two zeros and then zero, one, zero, zero. So how does this number right here correspond with this number? Well, it's shifted left once again by one place. So what are we looking to do? This is sort of algorithmic development that we're going to do inside of C++. So this bottom number, anytime we see the bottom number have a one in the ones place, what we do is we copy the top number down. For every single time we do that, we shift the bottom number to the right by one place because we, don't want, we no longer care about those digits. And then we shift the top number to the left by one place. So this is what we do. We shift it by one place to the left. That gives us that number. Now, if we shift 0111 to the right by one place, what are we going to get? 0011. And then if we shift that right by one place, 0001. If we shift that right by one place, 0000. And then we're done. And so that's what we're going to do here is as long as this number is not zero, we just keep shifting the top number to the left once, the bottom number to the right once. And what we do is we check that bit. If that bit in the new ones place is a one, we add the top number. If it's not, if it's a zero, we just skip it. We shift the top number to the left by one place, we shift the bottom number right by one place. So it's going to look something like this. So what we're gonna look at is how we can implement something like this in C++. So the product, is going to equal zero, okay? So right now, if we, have, if we don't do any multiplication at all, the product is gonna be equal to zero. Okay, so remember, we're gonna call the top number T, the bottom number B. So remember the bottom number, while B is not zero, that means we have something to multiply. Otherwise, what's going to happen? Well, this is going to be false and we get the value zero because anything times zero is zero, okay? So now what we're going to do is we look at the bottom number and the top number. So what we want to do is we want to see if this bottom number's ones place is one. And to do that, remember we just use the and operator. Okay, so b and one is equal to one. That tells us that the number is one. So if that's the case, we add the top number. Okay, so there you go. So what we do is, okay, if there is a one in that one's digit, remember we're going to shift it right and shift the top number left. If there is a one there, we copy the number. Otherwise we don't do anything, right? We don't copy a zero down because adding zero to product just doesn't do anything, okay? So now that we're done with that, we're going to take the top number, shift it left one place, and we're gonna take the bottom number and shift it right by one place. So what that's going to do is eventually, because we shift so many places, B will become zero. Now, hopefully you're thinking in the back of your mind, well, what if B is a negative number? In that case, it will never become zero. And so that illustrates another thing that we have to do inside of this division or inside of this multiplication. This multiplication is unsigned multiplication. None of these are stored in two's complement format. They're just positive numbers. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, then how do we actually multiply negative numbers? Well, it's fairly straightforward if you remember the rules of multiplication. If we add two positive numbers together, we get a positive, regardless of what their values are. If we add a minus and a positive or a positive and a minus, we get a negative number. Or if we multiply two negative numbers together, we get a positive. So we can use this to actually multiply positive numbers. Well, how do we change a negative number into a positive number? Well, we take the two's complement. So what we have to do is we have to test those numbers. If T, and we write shift by uh, 31 places, if it's a 32-bit integer, and one. So this is the sign bit, if you remember. If that is the case, then what we have to do is we have to say, okay, we saw one positive. So bool, bool, we'll just call it sign. 
Okay, so in this case, we say sine is not sine. So what's gonna happen? Well, if we have an even number of these, because we're gonna test the bottom now, well, what's gonna happen is this will go right back to, to false. So if you remember, the not inversion operator, so that's the Boolean not operator with the exclamation point, what that's going to do is it's gonna take a false and make it true, or take a true and make it false. So then we test the bottom. Now remember, this is only for integers. And there we go. So that's how we keep track of the sign. So in the end, if we, if, if we take a look at this, if the top is negative and the bottom is positive, we're going to pass the check on the if statement on the top and false will go to true. And then we'll fail the second check and so sign is going to be true. And at the end, whenever we're done with multiplication, we just say, okay, if the sign is true, set the value negative. How do we do that? Well, we take the two's complement. So there's one additional thing that we have to do here before we're done. So if it is negative, we have to make it positive. And so we're gonna say t equals two's, so that's the two's complement function. And remember, two's complement is flip all the bits, add one. So that's fairly straightforward. And the same thing goes for the bottom, because what we're doing is we're only multiplying positive numbers. And so what we do is we use the rules of multiplication because we know based on the sign before we even start multiplying what the output is going to be, whether it's positive or negative. And so we're gonna use that to our advantage just to multiply positive numbers. Okay, then what we do is we do that while loop that I showed you. And then at the very end, we say, if sign, so that means if it's true, then what we do is we take the result or product, whatever you wanna call it, and we flip it to a negative number. And so that is how you're going to perform multiplication in C++. And the reason I wanna show you this is we wanna do it bitwise, because once again, we're going to get into digital logic fairly later, but we only have little wires that run one bit at a time. And we have to understand what's going on there to be able to implement this in hardware. Because you know we, we can think of this in software or I know what to punch in, but how do we actually use our minds to implement that inside of the computer. And so that is multiplication in a nutshell. So let's talk about division. In division, there are two different ways to do it. Now there's one that's very inefficient, but it's the easiest to, to denote. So let's take a look at, at division. So remember what a quotient and a remainder are. A quotient, so say we had 17 divided by two. So what this is saying is how many times can two be pulled out of 17? That's the quotient. Okay, and then the remainder is everything that couldn't be pulled out of 17, right? So anything not a multiple of two in this case. So we take 17, we subtract two. What does that give us? Well, it gives us 15. We subtract two, 13, 11, nine, seven, five, three, and then one. Okay, so we subtract two here, subtract two here, subtract two, subtract two, subtract two, subtract two. Now this is less than two, so we can't subtract two there. So what we do is for the quotient, we count the number of times we subtracted two. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. So the quotient is eight, and the remainder is whatever is left over. So we do eight times two, which is 16, and subtract that from the original number. So it's 17 minus eight times two, which gives us the value one. So that is how we can perform division fairly straightforward. And this is what's called repeated subtraction. So we keep decrementing the number. Now, obviously, even with a small number like 17, I had to loop eight times. And so you can see this is going to be very, 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 very inefficient if we have a subsequently large number. And so that's why we have what we're going to implement inside of the computer, which is called restoring division. So let's take a look at this algorithm. So in restoring division, what we're going to do is we have to store several pieces of information. Remember we have the remainder and we have the quotient, but we also need to see whether it's a divide by zero. So that's an error case. So in this case, I created a structure the structure is called result, and the structure contains a quotient and a remainder. Now, it doesn't make any sense to have a negative remainder. Now, once again, this is unsigned division, so that means everything has to be a positive number. Well, we can use the rules of multiplication just like we can with division 
to do the exact same thing. So let's take a look at what restoring division is. So we use the same result here. We got a quotient, we have a remainder, and a divide by zero. So the very first check I'm going to do here is, okay, are we dividing by zero? Let me make this a little bit bigger here. Are we going to divide by zero? If we're going to divide by zero, we just say, okay, quotient zero, remainder zero, and then we set the error case to true. Otherwise, what we do is we set it up to get ready to be done, okay? So I use an R, capital R here, because you'll notice that we are given integers, and now I'm going to increase the size capacity to longs, and you'll see why. So there's an actual mathematical equation behind how this works. It's not that important for what we're doing here, but it makes sense. It sort of illustrates why we do this operation right here. So the remainder is equal to the dividend, okay? So if you don't remember that, that's the top number, 17 divided by two, the dividend would be 17, the divisor would be two. Uh, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take the top number and put it into a much larger capacity. So from 32 bits, we widen it. So going from a small number to a large number, we widen it into a 64-bit number. And then the bottom one, we're going to static, static cast this long into a to static cast the divisor into a long. Now we have to do that before we left shift by 32 because if we take an integer and left shift it by 32, we just get the value zero. So in this case, what we've done is we've expanded divisor, we've widened it into a 64-bit number and we left shift it by 32. Now there's a reason we do that, but once again, it just goes based on this equation down here. So that's how we're going to perform the division. Okay, so now what we do is we start from the left and we go bit by bit. Now notice we start at bit 31. That's typically the sign bit, but we're doing unsigned division here. So what we do is we go bit by bit and see what we're going to store in that place. So that's all we do is we say, okay, what do we need to place in here? So the first thing we have to do is we have to subtract off the divisor. Remember divisor is the bottom number. So in this case, remember it was two or something like that. Okay, so what if the divisor was bigger than the remainder, well, what that tells us is we can't fit it. That means it's not a divisible number in that case. Okay, so remember we're doing this place by place. So we're looking at this in this place, the tens, I'm sorry, the eights place, the sixteens place, that sort of stuff. So don't think of it as, well, if you subtract off the divisor and it's zero or something like that, well then it's always gonna be zero. No, we're doing this place by place. So what we do is if the remainder is greater than zero, that tells us that after we subtracted the divisor, there's more left. And so that tells us that this bit needs to be one. So if you recognize this, we're actually doing the price is right method. Okay, so what we do is we subtract off the divisor. If we can express that magnitude at this bit, we set it equal to one. And remember, this is the set that we did. So we or it with one shifted left by the index, in this case, 31 through zero. Otherwise, what do we do? Well, the remainder has to add on the divisor because we were not able to capture that magnitude. So later down the line, we have to capture that magnitude, so we add in the divisor. So in this case, it tells you that whenever we subtracted off the divisor here, the remainder was bigger than zero. So that tells you, yes, you could divide this place by that number. Otherwise, that tells you that no, this number is too big for the divisor. And so what we do is we take the remainder, we add in the divisor. So this else statement is what's called the restoring portion of it. If we didn't restore it, what we'd do is we would go place by place, and all we would do is find one magnitude that happened to be the divisor. And then what we do is the remainder is going to be up in the upper 64 bits. And the reason we do, or the upper 32 bits of a 64 bit number. The reason we do that is because of this equation right here. So this is the equation, I'm not a mathematician, but this is the equation we use to actually perform restoring division. Okay, so notice it's sort of a recursive function in that R of I is equal to of R of I plus one. So as you can see, all numbers sort of uh, co-depend on each other. And then we subtract off the divisor, multiply it by two to the ith place. Now, two to the ith place, you know we can do that by taking one and left shifting by i places, which is exactly what we're, I'm sorry, which is what we're doing here. So i plus one here is this right here. So this remainder is r of i. So that's that portion of the equation. Equals remainder of i plus one, so that's why we left shifted by one place, minus the divisor. So that's how we get this right here. So what we're doing is we're subtracting this portion off right here. And we do that place by place. So I in this case is the place, the ten, uh, the eighth place, the sixteenth place, and so on and so forth. So this is what's called restoring division. And whenever I did a test on this, restoring division happened to be about 10 times quicker than normal division. Why? Because we only have to go 32 places. Remember with repeated subtraction, we have to keep subtracting until 
the top number is smaller than the bottom number. And then what we do is we, we restore that and say this is what the remainder is going to be. So remember on 17, we had to loop eight different times and we don't want to do that. So in this case, we have to go 32 times. So even for a very, very, very large number, we are still only looping 32 times. That's it. Whereas repeated subtraction, it increases the number of loops increases or number of iterations in the loop increases as the number gets bigger. So let's talk about data widening and narrowing. There are two different ways we can do it. So narrowing is fairly straightforward because what we can do is we can truncate. Now, if you've recognized in C++ what we do, if we take a 32-bit number, let's just say a 16-bit number, uh, 1011001111111, okay? So this is a 16-bit number or a short in C++. Now, if we put this into a chart, what's that going to look like? Well, we actually grab the lower eight bits. So in a char, if we said this is short A, char B, we say B equals A. Well, what's B going to equal to? Well, B can only store eight bits. And so that's going to get 1110, 1111, this portion of the number. Everything up here is truncated. Okay, so this is called narrowing. Okay, and there's only one really real way to narrow but the important thing to know is it starts with the ones place and then adds up the number of bits that you have available so we don't take the upper bits we actually take the lower bits so this being upper and the ones place being the lower okay so upper is also known as most significant because if we change that bit from a zero to one, the number changes drastically. The lower is also known as the least significant because if we change that from a zero to one, the number only changes by one because that's the ones place. So that's called narrowing. So let's take a look at the other way around. So let's say we had char A equals one, 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 one. So if you recognize that, that's the value negative one. And then let's say we have short B. So what's going to happen here if we say B equals A? Well, there are two different ways we can widen this. So we, we know we're going to have 16 different places, but what happens if I widen this by just putting zeros in front of it? So I do 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Is this the value negative 1? Hopefully you're saying no to yourself because if I flip all the bits and add 1, we're going to get 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, that is not the value negative one. Instead, negative one would be all ones, 16 bits of ones. So how do we get that? Well, in signed, whenever we widen a signed number, what we're going to do is we're going to take, it's called sign extension. We take the sign bit of the smaller data, data size, in this case, a char. So remember, we look at the left number, which is bit index seven here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the sign bit and we're going to replicate it for all whatever we need to wide. So remember, we're gonna go from eight bits into 16. So how many extra bits do we actually get? Well, we get eight extra bits. And so what's going to happen is a sign extension, we call it SX sign extension. We take the one and we replicate it for all of the new bits that we have available to us. So what does that look like? Well, we take the one and we replicate it, which will give us this value. So if we flipped all the bits, that would give us zero. So all ones go to zero. Add one, that gives us the value negative one, just like this. So we actually don't change the value by widening it into a larger data size. And we don't want to. We just want to be able to store more bits, but we don't want to actually change the value. So that's what's called sign extension. So that's what we do for sign extension. So that is automatically performed by C++ whenever the right hand side of the equal sign right here is a signed number. If it's an unsigned number, we perform something called zero extension. And so in this case, what happens is instead of taking the sign bit, which is a one, if it's negative or a zero, if it's positive, we always put zeros in the widened. So that's why that does that in unsigned numbers, because we don't want to replicate the sign bit. Otherwise, our small number just became a really, really large number for an unsigned value. So those are the two different ways that we can actually widen a number. So remember, to narrow a number, we just take the lower bits. So if we're going from 32 to 16, we take the lower 16 bits, that becomes our new value. If we're going to widen, we can do signed, which is called sign extension. And what that does is it takes the sign bit, the most of a bit of the small number, and replicates it in those new bits that we widened into. So if we went from eight bits to 32, we take the sign bit and we replicate that 24 times to form a 32-bit number. 
Otherwise, if we had an unsigned value on the right-hand side of the equal sign, we're going to perform what's called zero extension. And so if we go from eight bits to 20, uh, 32 bits, 24 of those bits will become zero. And remember, for a positive number, as long as we stick zeros on the front of it, it doesn't change its magnitude. If you saw with a negative one, as long as we put ones in front of it, because of that two's complement format, as long as we put ones in front of a negative number, it doesn't change its value. So that is how we perform widening and narrowing. Thanks for watching.